Hello and welcome to the Grand Touring Motorsports Podcast, Break, Fix, where we're always fixing to break into something motorsports related. Tonight, our guest is an author and historian with a passion for hidden history, revisionist historical narratives, vintage cars, and the unsung heroes of World War II. His father, a five-term U.S. Senator from Virginia, his mother, the daughter of a renowned Pittsburgh-born philanthropist, his stepmother, a famous celebrity. If you haven't guessed it by now, we're honored and excited to have John W. Warner IV on Break Fix, a former IMSA pro driver turned gentleman farmer, car collector, and passionate petrolhead, to talk about his historical fiction series, Little Anton, which is part satire, part love story, and a dash of espionage. And I promised John we wouldn't talk about aliens. Maybe. (laughs) So welcome to Break Fix, John. Howdy. How are you doing? Let me put this in perspective for our our folks that are listening in. You and I have had the pleasure of meeting up several times during the course of the last couple of years. Last names withstanding, I didn't really realize how tied into the automotive and motorsports world you were until we both participated in the Classic Car Tour back in the 2018-2019 season, where I was introduced to John W. Warner IV kind of behind the scenes. I got to see some of your collection, your racing memorabilia, hear your war stories, pun intended, which leads to our first question. Were you always into cars? Was that your thing? Has it always been a passion? How did you find yourself behind the wheel? Well, I have a dual passion, everything to do with space and Star Trek and UFOs and all that. But also I had a passion for cars at an early age. When I was in college, I scraped together all the money I had in the world and I borrowed five grand from my dad, who was a lifetime Lincoln driver. And he says, what what the hell kind of car are you going to get, son? And I said, oh, don't worry, it's going to be a Ford. As long as it's a Ford, I'm fine with it. Here's five grand, pay me back later. And so I went down in Charlottesville when I went to UVA. Brady Bushy Ford there, they had a uh, used car building and inside was a lime green 1972 Pantera. Well, that's Ford adjacent. Yeah. I was like, tell me about it. I was kind of gearhead. And he's like, well, this car's got no radio. It's too loud. And the former owner was a GT40 driver and he pulled the motor and blueprinted it. And it's got a solid lifter cam and, you know, big Holly double pumper, higher compression and all that jazz. And I said, (laughs) I'll take it. (laughs) Where do I sign? And I took a salesman for a little drive. This is before I learned to race because my father got me into racing. Actually. Really? I gave him a ride in the car one night at 140 miles an hour. Same thing with the salesman. <laughs> my dad said, oh, Jesus Christ, you're going to kill us all. Go get some professional driving lessons. I'll pay for them. I insist. The next week, I was off to Skip Barber Racing School. This was the summer of 1983. I met Paul Newman and Tom Cruise was there in my class. He was late. I was friends with Newman from then on. I actually dated his daughter later in life. They were a a wonderful, nice family. They were just the nicest people. And he and I raced together later on in uh, Grand Am, IMSA, American Le Mans series at uh, Daytona and Sebring. You know, my father got me into it. You know, that's not something I would have guessed. I don't know why I didn't put those two things together. So was your dad passionate about cars and racing? No, no. Lifetime Lincoln, man. Oh, no. He was a 55 mile an hour guy. I usually had a a driver, you know, in his Senate days, but he always instilled responsibility and safety with me all throughout my life. He said, listen, you know, you're a good, responsible kid, but you're 21 and you need to learn to drive because this thing will kill you. And he was right. How I didn't kill myself, I, I don't know. That was a genuine 160 mile an hour car with that engine in it. I did it <laughs> late at night one time with a friend. He knew that it, it would save my life and it probably did. That's one of a few Widowmakers that you've owned. I'll tell you that Pantera was a really nice handling car. Engine would protruding into the cab. Talk about mid-engine. It was more mid-engine than either the Ferrari 308 or the Boxer at the time. And I've owned two Boxers and they handle like shit compared to a Pantera. I mean, they're wonderful cars beautiful sounding engines, but they don't have any torque. The Pantera would eat it alive. The Pantera is very neutral handling. And so you could go into a turn, a really tight turn hot and lift off the gas and the nose would point in gently. Beautiful understeer built into it just enough. When I came back from racing school, I, you know, I, I could drive all of a sudden. I noticed that the car was very neutral to balance. So I, I think it was a very safe car. Your dad put you in racing school. What did your mom think about all this? Well, she was more of a car person than dad was. She taught me to drive one day. I was 12 years old. Out in the rural Virginia in 1974, you know, 
it was no big deal for a parent to have a kid drive them to the store. And today it's a different deal. She said, you know, put the booster seat in and said, drive. There's the clutch. That's the brake. That's the gas. It's four speeds. She had a BMW. It was a 3.0 CS coupe. And I said, okay. And then dad, I think two years later, was like, come on, I'm going to teach you to drive my Bronco. He had a 75 Bronco. And I said, oh, mom already taught me to drive when I was 12. He's like, what? Both parents instilled that in me. Not to foreshadow what we're going to talk about in a little bit here, but did your passion for Porsches start at an early age or did that come at a later time? That came at a later time. I had always noticed them and liked them. Boy, I'll tell you, a friend told me to buy a used 911 Turbo back then before I bought the Pantera, and I'm glad I didn't. It was a novice driver, and the trailing throttle oversteer on those old ones is bad. But once you master it, it's great. Back then, I kind of knew that from reading Road and Track, and I was like, you know what? It was the Pantera was badass. You know, it had every bit of 370 or 80 horsepower, which was a lot back then in 83. It could take on anything in the world. And in Lime Green, they saw you from a mile away and they heard you from a mile away too they did the state trooper one one guy pulled me over in charlesville and he said son this car is too loud too low and too green and he gave me a ticket for no front license plate i don't know how i never got a ticket for speeding in that thing it's a miracle but i got a ticket for everything else another porsche question what was the first porsche you ever purchased i had a couple of girlfriends with volkswagen bugs i was really impressed with those i had a, a girlfriend with a 914 and i was amazed at how it handled in college and so i bought it from her but immediately sold it two weeks later to a friend of mine but i was impressed with the handling my first porsche that i bought was the race car actually i bought a 911 gt3r water cooled from the factory you know it was factory race car it's racing for a german team and they're like ah we had the coffee sale you sissy man they would call me Werner and so on speed vision at the time I'm W-E-R-N-E-R Werner Johan Werner yeah drink the beer before the race and so my first car was the race car but then when I got home I bought a used 911 C4S from a friend and I love that car but the race car was awesome we had problems with the early water cool blocks like at the day going on 24 hours we blew through a block and practice but the factory fedex is one overnight from germany a long block that's porsche for you i mean i raced on a german privateer team but they had factory support in the back door because they were german let's expand upon that a little bit more so you know you went through racing school paul newman tom cruise all these kinds of things and then you find yourself in imsa you know what was alms then is still now imsa today soon to be merged with the wec to become whatever these new classes are that they keep talking about So late 90s, early 2000s, and three of the major cars that stick out, one of them you mentioned, the 911 GT3R, Corvette C5R, and a Toyota. Of those three, which did you prefer? Well, definitely the Porsche. I'll tell you, the the Toyota was a spec series. It was a sports Toyota Pro Series. They were very good mid-engine, open, sort of a mini prototype. I have a guy around Riley and Scott. Why don't you move up into that? And I said, no, I'm going to do a couple years in a 911 before I do a prototype. I had just done a year, two seasons of Grand Am and a Corvette CE5, which I really liked. Uh, The only problem with the Corvettes was the slicks got greasy about 40 minutes into they last an hour, depending on track, conditions, and heat. You'd be going through the corners just sliding around. But the Porsche kept its weight on the rear wheels, and it had a, a distinct advantage in the corners. And the Corvettes were allowed to have a little more power, so you could pass on the straights. But I found I could dive into the corners and beat people that way. In a Porsche, I was like, why would anyone race anything else? I mean, I really felt that way. I, I don't plug for the Porsche factory or anything. But that car saved my life on many occasions. And I just got a real appreciation for the engineering that went into it. It was evolutionary. I had a brief couple races in a, in a rented, air-cooled. And then briefly, I, I did a, the GT1 with the twin turbos. Newman raced that and the 2001 Daytona did a race or two in that. It had definitely had turbo lag problems and other electronics problems. It wasn't the car. The car was set up great. We talked about it on an episode in season one about the gentleman drivers. And I'm wondering, were you officially on a team or were you considered a gentleman driver? And I don't mean that in an offensive sort of way, more of a curiosity sort of thing. I'm not even sure what the definition of gentleman driver is other than just some rich ding dong, you know, going to rent a car. I didn't do it that way. My father told me some good advice. He says, he came to a race of mine when I was doing SECA National in Austin Healy. I said, oh, I'm moving up to this Toyota Pro thing. He'd always tell me never do anything half ass and don't jump into something that you're not prepared for. And so I really was very conservative. I raced with some very rich guys who would buy a brand new car, 
but they didn't have jack shit for experience. And they would obviously spin out and they couldn't take the heat of professional racing. That happened on a number of occasions, but I had five years in the Toyota series, two years in SCCA Pro and the Vets, and then the Grand Am and the Vets and other things. I really worked my way up slowly because I didn't want to be this rich dilettante, not knowing what the hell they're doing, but they've got the money to buy two cars or a stable of cars. I never did that. I rented cars until the Porsche, and then I, I had to buy it. I enjoyed racing with drivers who came up through the ranks like I did and, and didn't just buy their way in. That's a really dangerous thing to do. Absolutely. And people get killed all the time in their arrogance. They're like, I built this company. I'm CEO. I've made $700 million and I'm going to buy a brand new Ferrari race car. And, and they stuff it into a wall after going to racing school for two weeks. Pro racing, is, it weeds out the children from the adults. Some of the women I raced against, one was a paraplegic. She was the best racing driver I ever saw. Car caught fire. She called herself out of the car by herself. And we were all there clapping. And like, Holy shit. You know, that's real balls. It was that woman. I always tell that to people. You know, I had a girlfriend who says, you know, you do all these macho things. And I said, oh, no. I race against some very good women who take it very seriously. And you would have come up through the same era as like Lynn St. James and Willie T. Ribs and all those folks that were in Trans Am in the 70s, 80s and, and 90s as well. Sort of. I mean, I, I 83, I was 21. So I started early, but I went through the Skippy series for four or five years. I really didn't think I was going to go beyond that. I thought it was just going to be a hobby and, and everything. And, you know, my dad said, don't do anything half-assed. So I didn't. But by the time I got into the Toyota stuff, I, I won a minor award for most improved driver. It was like 40 of us. And my crew chief said, it's time to move on. The problem with those cars, they were momentum cars and they didn't have a lot of power. They would go 145, but I, I wanted to be in a GT3 or two. Or yeah. One. What do you think are some of the, uh, other than the quadriplegic pulling herself out of the car at Sonoma, I think it was the racetrack, yeah. if I recall the story correctly. What other memorable moments from racing? Like maybe some folks that, you know, you encountered that maybe kind of put you in awe. Like one of the characters in your book, Han Stuck Sr., did you ever meet Hans Stuck, his son? I wish I had. I was going to race in Europe for the, not the Super Cup. It was another series in 2002, but my back went out on me and I never got to Europe. I was going to move there for a year. I was going to live in Munich or somewhere with this German team, but it all fell apart. I met Newman early on, but my sister knew him. I dated his daughter briefly for a few years and he and I became good friends. Around Daytona, 24 hours in 2001, it rained all night. Oh, that was awful. He was in the class above me. I was in the GT3. He was in a GT1 Porsche. And he would flip me the bird every time he passed me on the oval, you know, on the high bank <laughs> in the rain. You know, I'm like behind Dale Earnhardt and his son. They were in the vets. I'm like, oh, shit, what am I doing here? You know, going 180 and you're following a little red light and all this spray. And you're praying the guy ahead of you knows where to break to turn one. I thought I was going to die that night. You know, Unreal. I, I didn't really meet any. I, I met, you know, Mario Andretti and some of the big drivers through, through Newman. I would hang out in his IndyCar pits with the family. And that was a lot of fun. I thought Andretti was kind of arrogant. <laughs> you know, it's like, don't meet your heroes, you know. I was lucky. I mean, Newen was this down-to-earth guy. He was a really good driver. I wish I was as good as he was. Of all the racetracks that you've driven on, what's your favorite or your least favorite? Of the tracks you wish you had driven, is there still something on your bucket list? Well, I can't drive anymore. Back's too bad. I'd always want to go to Le Mans. Check that out. My least favorite, uh, in the old days, Mossport in Canada had a hill that went down to a bridge. I was there one time and they're like, all right, the drivers, I mean, the guy just died yesterday in practice. And we're all like, oh, shit, really? They come down this hill at full speed and there's no protection against the bridge. Now, they fixed that over the years. But man, back in the early 90s when I was there, oh, my God. God, that was awful. The rest of the track was great. Sears Point, you got me. How you drive that track fast, it's beyond my, I don't know, weird setup turn. I never could get it right. I never got it right. My favorite was Sebring. It was flat. You had the nostalgia of it. Turns were perfectly proportioned. It was pretty fast. There was room to pass, you know, on down the line, flat out best. And, and I like Summit Point, West Virginia, which is my hometown track. It's a really good track. It's bumpy as hell. But if you can learn to drive there fast, you learn to drive anywhere. That's very, very true. You've alluded a couple of times, you know, back injury, back pain. Is that the reason you got out? What happened? What made you leave racing? Well, pain. I was getting ready for the 2002 season. I did a few practice runs in the 9-11, went back to the hotel. And I was like, oh my 
God, I chugged a half a bottle of Tylenol and nothing happened. And I just said, I, there's something wrong with me. And I went to the doctor. And I'll never forget it. He laughed at my MRIs. He goes, you're done. Two races prior to that in practice, I was at Road Atlanta and one of the Audi prototypes bumped me going in the downhill full speed. And I spun around into the, the, the wall, I don't know, 140, I, I can't remember what it was pushed the engine up against the firewall, didn't break through. Car saved my life. You know, I blacked out for a few seconds, but it was just an aggregation of all my accidents. I was riding Harleys and I was in good shape. I would go to the gym and I just thought I was invincible. I was 40 years old. I had just turned 40. And uh, the doctor was like, you've got compound fractures. You've got fractures in your pelvis. You didn't know about. I was like, oh, really? And he's got, you got two smashed discs. You're done. And then weirdly enough, a couple months later, I, I figured I'd take out the 2002 season and get an operation and get back into shape. I went head over heels in a mountain bike on the street at about seven miles an hour. And I hit everything. I broke my fright femur. I had about 30 fractures in my pelvis. That's when the compound fractures in the lower lumbar vertebrae started. I, I was just a mess. Wow. And you know, I'm still in pain to this day. I had three operations. This is really the jumping off point as to where you get to your writing career. Let me put a pin in that for just a moment. And let's come back and revisit this being in pain, coming off the bike, your, your last accident there. Some lighter hearted questions before we get into the meat of the conversation, which is your book series, Little Anton. I've seen your collection of cars, so I know it's quite eclectic, but what are your favorite kinds of cars and what would you consider the sexiest car of all time? You'd have to put it in a specific category. The sexiest car of all time, if I had to pick one, a, a sports GT car, I would do the Maserati Ghibli of the early 70s. I'm an artist. I can tell you there's not one awkward line or anything on that car. I don't, I've never owned one, but I, I've seen one in person. It's so low and proportioned so beautifully. And actually, it's a very good car, too. I mean, Maserati could really build a car with, with that engine was raced. It's just perfect. My back wasn't bad. I'd probably invest in one. It's such a, an amazing car to look at. It's breathtaking in person. It truly is. Now, Ferrari Daytona and GTO are, are close. The other one, sedan, would be the 1961 Lincoln Continental Suicide Door. Now, that car I do own. I've owned it for almost 20 years. You know, my wife and I just stare at that car. It is the most beautiful post-war four-door American car ever made, in my opinion. The Ford and Lincoln guys got it right. The proportions, I mean, the Kennedy White House was filled with them because Robert McNamara he used to be CEO of Ford. And Jackie Kennedy driving, I remember the Kennedys driving the cars when I was a little kid in the 60s, Cape Cod. My sisters were friends with them. I remember, you know, you get 10 kids on the back of the convertible. Those two cars, but I have to say for America, the 63 Stingray split window. I'd pick that over all other cars. My God, that thing is just perfect. What do you consider like the ugliest car ever? I don't. That's one of the questions in our meetings that people pass around. There's a million answers. You know, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. One person's idea of something good looking is another person's cool and weird. There's no answer to that. That is the most neutral answer we've ever received to that question. And I'm not, I'm not saying that's a bad thing. There's some ugly cars out there. To someone, it's always cool. That's very true. So are there still some cars on your bucket list that you'd like to own outside of, you know, a couple of the ones that you've already mentioned? 49 Cadillac Fastback sedan. It's definitely on my list uh, as my next car. I don't want to drive a super duper expensive car. It, it makes me a little nervous because I like to drive my cars. I barely even clean them. I'm in the poets group, you know, that category. We just drive our cars. It's, I don't go to shows and do the trophy thing. I could care less. I keep them relatively dust free, but I don't wash them a lot. Pre-war cars, I just can't do anymore. I need power steering now. That bike accident ruptured my rotator cuff. and It's just gotten worse with age. I'm on 60 now. Is there anything modern that would be on your list? Something that's caught your eye in the last maybe 20 or 30 years? Oh, yeah. I go to this local Sterling, Virginia Ferrari dealership. I know the guy's Italian. He likes to drive fast. So I drive all the new modern Ferraris. And back there, they got a road circuit. We really hammer the hell out of them. So I've test driven all of them. The new uh, Roma looks nice. But all these new sports cars, they look like angry insects, you know, from a sci-fi movie. I just can't get over the styling. Maybe that's just my age. I, I just don't like it. Everything's so techy in the Ferraris now. I have a 1968 365, and that's just such a beautiful, elegant car you know, with no fuss and electronics at all. I guess I'm kind of a Luddite that way. But as far as new cars, 
cars? That's a good question. What would I like to drive? I think the Bugattis are silly, even though Porsche has a hand in that engineering. Now, Professor Porsche would admire the design engineering, but he would not have liked the weight. He was into lightweight. And so was Gary Porsche, his son. And so to see this behemoth, you know, 16 cylinders and 50 radiators and 20 intercoolers and 50 turbos, even the professor, I think, would say, you know, Whoa, halt! No, no, no. It, it's just too much. I think it's it's just a toy for weirdos. I've slowed down in my old age. I, I don't get the rush of adrenaline. I, it's not pleasurable anymore. I collect old Cadillacs and Packards. My wife and I just love cruising. Uh, we still have three, five, six Ferdinand that we drive. I go around corners fast in that. But, you know, that's only got 105 horse. That's a lot for a 356. Yeah, it's got the 1800 CC kit on it. Oh, there you go. Maybe 110 on a cool day. <laughs> Boy, it's it's so much fun to drive, and it's actually rides pretty smooth. I can get away with it. I couldn't ride it for four hours, but I can do an hour and a half without hurting too bad. It's funny we're talking about a 356 here for just a minute because you know I'm a petrol head of a different generation. I grew up in the era of the 930 and the Countach and the Testarossa and the F40 and things like that. So those cars get my attention. But I've always had an appreciation for air cooled Porsches because that's what I grew up with as well. There's a common misconception when it comes to who who designed what? Oddly enough, I recently had a mutual friend of our Sal Finelli on an episode of Break Fix as well to talk about Porsche diesel tractors. And he dove into the Porsche history as well and you know who's designing what. And when the tractors came out, that was still during the last couple of years of Professor Porsche's life. And I'm like, did he actually design the tractors? Which kind of begged the question as I looked over things, he designed the Beetle, Ferry designed the 356, and Bootsy designed the 911. So it's kind of interesting to see the generations of the Porsche family and how they've evolved everything. People don't crack the big books. I talked to the guy at the Gamun Museum for hours with a translator. No, 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 no. Uh, Professor Porsche designed the first 356. Ferry took it from there, but no, he designed it. Porsche, people forget his World War I and earlier inventions. Before the tractor, he invented a, a front motor tiller tractor. Yes. In the teens, 1914 or something, for the German people, he was always about efficient designs of things. You know, he was an airplane engine designer, designed engines for a flying boat. It's all in my book. People always think, you know, the Beetle and everything. He designed a lot of different things. He was well-known genius in the 20s and teens and 20s, Germany and Austria. Uh, it wasn't this fame that he got with Hitler. Hitler was a nobody when he met Porsche in 27. Porsche was a famous man. Him and Bugatti were walking. That's a true story. Hitler and his entourage show up stinking like motor oil and armpits. And they were like, no, oh, these guys are whack job. <laughs> the old man designed the tractor as well. Ferry designed the 550, I think, you know, obviously, and all you know, the later 356 race cars and all that, the four-cylinder race car series, and then everything after that. Bootsy, you know, you know, the old man did the 356. His prototype for it still exists somewhere, and it's pre-war. It didn't have an engine, I don't think. Uh, it might be in the Porsche Museum. I can't remember. The 356 was designed loosely based on a Berlin to Rome aerodynamic car. But that was basically the genesis for the 356, the chassis and everything, and sort of the aerodynamics. People get a lot of that stuff wrong. It's no wonder because Road and Track and all these car magazines, those guys, they don't do much research. They do the minimum. They got a deadline. When I started this book, I'm a very detail-oriented person, as Porsche was. And the Germans are known for that, and Austrians. I hate it when Hollywood movies like Indiana Jones or whatever have, even war movies and books and things, they get the details wrong. I went to extra lengths to get the details right. I don't introduce a gun or a plane or a car until the moment in history that it was introduced. I don't play fast and loose with facts. I hate that in movies and books and, and things. Oh, they'll never notice. And most people don't, I understand that. And so I, in my books, I get a lot of compliments over the email of people like, you really sweated the details. You got things right. I went on the Access Forum and the one guy that said, oh, yeah, you, you get things really right in your book. You don't screw around. So I'm very proud of that. I do have revisionist history, but there's a lot of true stories in there mixed in. I do write fantasy, but it's all based in probable reality. And Heinkel does something. I put the serial number. You know, it, it's that kind of detail. I don't want World War II, especially the, you know, the, the German buffs coming after me and going, this guy's a hack. But, you know, I, I write every book I can on the old man. And uh, no, he doesn't get enough credit. Everyone thinks Ferry Porsche did everything. It's like, nope. 
He didn't. He helped his father. He was there every step of the way. And he was a very good engineer and designer in his own right. A lot of it is, you know, the, the father and son. Very much so. And, and especially in those last years of his life, because a lot of people also don't realize that he was put in jail or in prison for being associated with, you know, potentially with war crimes and whatnot, and obviously with the Third Reich and all that, because Hitler did have him under contract to build the people's car and all that kind of thing. So another reason the French put Ferdinand Porsche in prison for two years, not just because of his war crimes, he was just an engineer. You know, I'm not going to debate that. that They pressured all the industrial. Join the SS. Before the war, he had been working with Renault and had licensed his torsion bar suspension. I can't remember, but there was some foul deal going on with Peugeot, and they got pissed at him, and then the war started. And so that was another reason why they kept him in jail, was that bad deal with the two French car companies. So I just want to throw that out there. That in in my new book, Porsche, you know, he admits that they've got twenty thousand Russians, Jews, and other people working at the Wolfsburg fact. And my character B shakes him and says, "Don't you dare go up against the SS. They'll kill you." And they don't care who you are. I think that you're right. It's it's pulling a thread. Like Ferry kind of continued, you know, the 356 A, Bs, and Cs, and all those that are more popular than the earlier Gmund cars. You know, I associate with Ferry specifically because he was left with the companies. Like, what are we going to do with this now? And they had to keep things going, put bread on the table, et cetera. And obviously, they had a reputation to maintain having that legacy that his father had already built. Kind of interesting how all that plays out. And much like the intro, it's those unsung stories. It's kind of clearing up some of the more commercialized and watered down versions of Porsche's story, even Enzo's story, Lamborghini, going back into all these legacy car designers and families that are are now known worldwide. And I have a very pointed Porsche question to ask you. This question came up internally a long time ago, and it raged a really fierce debate about ethnicity versus citizenship. And actually, Porsche Sr. was the crux of the argument, oddly enough. And it was whether he was Austrian or Czech. And where did he align himself and how did he identify as a person? And so I want to ask you this two ways. One, because you've found a way to bring his story to life and fill in a lot of gaps, especially through your research. And two, because you are a known Porsche historian. So what is the truth there? Was he Czech or was he Austrian? Well, both. He was born in the Austro-Hungarian Empire. In 1886, he was an Austro-Hungarian. You know, that region is Bohemia. So you could say he's a Bohemian, which he was. Today, it's like Silesia and part of the Sudetenland. So he was all that. But he did identify with Austria. He never really identified with Germany, though. He was always Austrian in his heart. My aunt was Austrian. And so she was able to give me some intel on that. Austrians are very proud of their heritage. They call the Germans Piefke, is the German pronunciation. And I say that in the book, he and Oscar make fun of the Germans. It's like someone from New York talking about California. It's like, well, we're Americans, but not really. I don't know what language they're speaking. And so there are subtle differences in the German from region to region, Swabian German versus Prussian and, and other things. So People identified with region, but he identified himself as Bohemian and Austrian. Part of the argument was it didn't matter what the paperwork said. It didn't matter that the lines had been redistricted and the area that he lived in is now what we know as Czechoslovakia. It wasn't back then. Exactly, exactly. But as a person, you identify a certain way and we could extrapolate that into a lot of different things. But in this sense, patriotically, you know, where his ethnicity. So I wanted to confirm, at least from your knowledge, that yes, Porsche Sr., if you asked him, he would have said, I'm Austrian. Yes. And he was proud of being from Bohemia. They've changed the name of this town from Mappersdorf to something else. But he was Austrian. Hitler had an affinity for him. He was a fellow Austrian. People always think Hitler's German. He's not. He's Austrian. And That's very true. for us here in America, it did, what's the difference? But over there, there's a big difference. Like I said, when I did this Porsche tour and history mission that I did in Germany, I went to Germany twice to research the book. He was Austrian and my aunt was Austrian. And they were like, oh, don't you ever call us Germans. They're friendly and they've always had cross-pollinization. It's a myth that Austrians welcomed Hitler with open arms in 1938. Most of them were not happy with the Anschluss. And Portia and his family, I wrote it that they're not happy either. My editor liked that quote. I have a very short chapter of him and Ferry listening to the radio. And my editor liked that above all else in the book. Hitler favored Portia. Obviously, he contracted Portia, well known at the time, as you said. Hitler was a nobody when Portia was already on the scene. It made me wonder, though, Outside of fame and notoriety and the celebrity that Portia had, Hitler was very much 
a Mercedes man. Let's put it that way. So why didn't he go to Mercedes and have them build the people's car, a group that was already established? Porsche didn't have a factory. Porsche didn't have the assembly line and all these people behind him to build the Volkswagen originally. So that's a part of history I've never understood. Why Porsche above Auto Union or Horch, DKW or NSW or Wanderer or any of these folks that were still around, but Mercedes above all, because he was such a fanatic about Benz's. It's a complex story and most people don't know it because it is so complex. I write it as clear as I can in the book. He opened his Porsche design firm in 1930, in the middle of the depression. The lightweight, inexpensive people's car was not his idea or Hitler's. It had been floating around Germany for a while. French had an idea to do it too. The problem was steel cost money and engineering cost money and got to sell millions of these. Couldn't figure out how to do it. Cars were a luxury item. Even for middle-class people, they were a luxury item. And so Joseph Gans, I think, was the originator of, of his lightweight car. Which, and Porsche had met with him. People say, oh, he stole his idea. Well, everyone was stealing each other's ideas. He admired Gans. And I wrote that in the book. Saw Gans's car. It was very promising. But I could do better because his engine's water-cooled and all. Too many things to break down. Hitler had the idea, Mercedes had toyed around with it. They couldn't figure out how to make it work economically. A lot of the horch is luxury. Auto Union wasn't interested. It was just a third rail thing. It was like, oh, we can't do it. And it took Hitler and, and the Reichsbank and everyone to force it to be done. The car manufacturers didn't want to do it because Mercedes is the luxury brand. It wasn't like today where they've got a million cars for sale. They had like five and they didn't want to build some dinky toy. Oh, no. And Porsche had the dream to do it. And Hitler had the dream to do it. I think Alfred Rosenberger and Hans Stuck had something to do with it. It's a little unclear, but they ended up in Hitler's office and they were like, we can make this work, but man, we're going to need money to do it. And he's like, don't worry about that. I need to auto-mobilize the populace. That's a verb. People think I made that up. I didn't. Hitler was very enamored with Mercedes. They picked him up at Landsberg Prison in 1923 with two supercharged S-Class. They knew the value of political people on the road. Mercedes was trying to market itself. Hitler was a bit of a gearhead in his letter, which I published in the book. I publish it verbatim. And he says, I need require this and such gear ratios and for this amount of RPM and which is more efficient. He had some knowledge of that. He wasn't stupid. He was just crazy. He was a madman, but he wasn't stupid by any means until the drugs and everything later on in the war got to his head. He's a megalomaniac and, and, and all that. But in the early days, he was definitely a psychopath, but that really didn't mature. But when Porsche met him, the stories I was able to piece together was Porsche and Bugatti were not impressed with this politician. But Porsche was impressed with the letter that he wrote to Jacob Verley and said, God, this guy's not half idiot after all. He likes cars and everything like this. And it really is true that Hitler knew who Porsche was. The troops in the trenches in World War One, the German troops, they know who was designing the Fokkers and the engines and all that. It was the Red Baron and everybody, but it was Porsche. They knew he was a famous man. And of course, he did artillery trains and mortar stuff. And he developed a lot of things. That history is forgotten. That's why I, I made this book an epic throughout 45 years or more, because I wanted to showcase his early life. No one talks about it. And I didn't know a lot about it until I started to research it. It was astounding. He was recognized as a genius in World War One. So as we dive into your book a little bit, you reminded me of that scene with Bugatti at the beginning stages of the book where it's told almost from Professor Porsche's perspective, where he's there working with the Mercedes race team, whatnot, and then there's Bugatti's chasing them down in another one of the in his own vehicle, and he refers to him as this arrogant Frenchman. And that's another thing that's always funny is Bugatti is associated somehow with Italian cars, even though they're French. He's French. It's, it's an Italian sounding name. I found that whole scene to be extremely comical. And I think it's a great jumping off point for going back to what we put a pin in, which was how did you go from pro racing driver to automotive historian slash author? Well, I've always been interested in history. My degree at University of Virginia was in Russian history and Russian studies, Cold War and all the whole history. So I had a history back and a good friend of mine, when I was laid up in 2006, you know, I was in terrible pain. He said, look, buy a laptop and teach yourself to write. You, you wrote really good, funny stuff in high school. You need to do it. And I was like, all right. I didn't really want to do it. <laughs> 
that's how I got into it. I had a history background. I traveled all over the world with my dad carrying his suitcase. I went to Russia with him to meet Gorbachev with Bob Dole and a bunch of senators. I was the only one who knew anything about Russian history or culture. And these guys were like, oh, we're not going to the Bolshoi. I'm going to go to bed early. And I said, every one of you is going to go to the Bolshoi. That's a rude thing to do. The Russian people take their culture seriously, their literature and all this. And uh, I was read a lot of books on World War II. I, I can label myself now as a World War II historian. I have enough knowledge. And of course, I'm a Porsche historian. Honestly, when I went to the museum, they were very nice, but they didn't know jack shit. And they would not talk about World War II. And they didn't know anything. I had to go to the moon. I had an Austrian guy on my Porsche tour. And he said, I know some people that know some people. And I talked to people in their 90s who had been through the war. This is 10 years ago. So I had firsthand accounts. I met an old woman who had met the professor when she was a little girl. One degree of separation. And, you know, the museum and all this stuff, they want that World War II history to go away. In Germany, they've got this thing, well, if they outlaw the swastika and they outlaw fascism, it'll go away. Uh-uh. It won't. And they're doing the, everyone a disservice by trying to ignore it in some ways. The Porsche Museum needs to get over it. I mean, they should have a model of the Porsche Tiger tank. And that's in my new book. You know, right, That's another thing that I was surprised. It was somewhat referenced, but not directly in the early chapters, because you do cover a lot of the World War I efforts. And, and some of those scenes... I love the way they were graphically represented. He's out there on the mountain. It's cold, breath of the, the soldiers, all this stuff, and the anxiety. And it painted this awesome picture. And I like the fact that the book isn't too technical. And having a background, even as a petrol head, it resonates. Anybody that has any mechanical background, you get it. It's not so over the top that my wife couldn't read it. Not that I want to insult her intelligence because she's a very bright young lady. It's very different than what I expected as I was diving into the book. So it goes it's on a great on. door stop. <laughs> no, I, I mean, I don't want to be overly complimentary, but what I, what I want to say is it, it's interesting how you were able to fill in the gaps and get all this research material on something, I don't want to say as obscure as Dr. Portia's life, but something that isn't as annotated as let's say Henry Ford's life is, right? Where you can dive into the, the history of Ford and, and figure out a lot of things and fill in the gaps very easily. Well, because Ford was a Nazi lover too. I mean, he, Portia hated the Nazis in the SS, but it's funny, Henry Ford was good friends with Hitler as well. You were able to thread it all together and piece it all together based on interviews, scraps of information, stuff that people probably wrote down for you on a napkin but the thing about the book that really got my attention is it's very dialogue forward yeah i've read plenty of historical fiction you know alternate history books and things like that they're very dry they're very whatever and and i'm not saying that's what was my prejudice going into this book but what i came to realize was there's these characters there's these other stories there's these these underlying arcs and how do you just conjure up this world around dr portia it wasn't easy and i'm not patting myself on the back I knew the story somewhat of the Silver Arrows and the uh, Auto Union Silver Fish, which most people don't get ever. They call them the Silver Fish. And actually Hitler picked the color as their national racing color. He polished an aluminum car in the 20s once. I think Neubauer did it to save weight, but that was a myth. The, the silver paint was made with fish scales. I put that in the book. Porsche's, you know, in World War I, he really was out there in the mud and he had that electric land train. He was very proud of that and it did work. It hauled, you know, mortars and stuff up the Austrian Alps to fight the Italians. And uh, he really was on the front lines. The books just say he was there and nothing else. And so I had to fill in, you know, he was from a family of pacifists. He hated war, but he was also very patriotic about Austria and then later Germany. But, you know, his boys were at the front dying. And to ask an engineer, we need this airplane engine or design this or this electric train thing. He's going to do it because, you know, those are his young countrymen dying. And, you know, his story with his brother is true, his older brother. Uh, that's the name of the book. There's not much. I tried to find some of the family members to tell me exactly what happened, but no one knew. But I'm not going to spoil that for the readers. The book is a tough read for other than for gearheads or World War II people. It is a tougher read. But I wrote it kind of with that. I was like, you know, regular folks aren't going to read this. And then it, the story became more metaphysical and it got bigger. It's really three novels in a, in a long story format. Portia, you know, it was hard because it, the books are just technical. And I had to piece together scraps. He'd like stale bread and the cookies in his pocket. 
That's true. He and his brother Oscar were close. You know, they had long talks. They would go hunting for stag and, and mushrooms, and his wife would make mushroom soup. And you know, these little things that gave him humanity. Whereas all the books are about racing and technical and the Volkswagen Beetle and Hitler and the Tiger Tank. And little about the man, what he was really like. And so I had to piece that together from a million different. That's why the book took me 10 years to write. But it takes on this life of almost a biography. It is his biography. I wanted to do that in a novel format. My editor had a cow with it, but we made it work. It's still too long for one story. I should have split it into two or three different books with beginnings and endings, but it is what it is. Uh, it's just three books. One of my things that I had to come to terms with as I've been reading it, fully admitting here for the audience that, you know, I haven't finished it yet because it is quite long. I'm on the old version of Little Anton, which is in two volumes. The first one is massive. And the second one is like a writer. It's like an appendix to, yeah, the, to the first volume. Yeah, yeah, exactly. The brick and the stick. Exactly. That's my wife's name for it. Yeah. As but, far as I know, I could be wrong. The only single novel that sold in a three-part set, I don't know of any others. My publicist and my editor, we were all like, no one's ever done this before. And I was like, well, I'll do it. <laughs> yeah, there you go. But that leads to my question and, and kind of my thought is what I tried to grasp when I was reading it. And for somebody that may be reading this book for the first time, what you realize is you dive right into the Porsche family story in the early, early days. Dr. Porsche is a kid and it kind of builds from there quite quickly into him being a young man and getting into engineering. I've seen some other things explained about his early days and how he got into electronics and he was auditing classes in Austria. And I've seen other versions of, of that story too, but I like the way you painted that picture and how you got us to his as an adult. But what ends up happening though, as you're reading it, suddenly you're introduced to these other characters. To use your words, a mad cat cast of characters in there this book. There is too many probably, but. And I love the personalities that you brought forth of let's say the Mercedes engineers, you know, and folks like you mentioned like Neubauer or even Hans Stuck's father, Hans Stuck Sr., right? Things like that where you personify them. They become real suddenly because they are too far in the past for any of us reading it now to have been maybe intimate with their story or have even met them. But what ends up happening is you flip the script suddenly and you're like well we're talking about b and we're on safari in africa and we're setting the story and i'm like wait this is like a whole nother book which kind of posed a question of like why didn't we just stick with portia in one book and then do some sort of crossover and do b in her book but i as i'm reading it more at first i was like oh maybe this is going to be to quote a movie title you know melvin goes to dinner which is like a come to jesus type of thing no it's not that this has to play out this way in order for us to get to where this all comes comes to a head and all these characters are now interacting with each other very, very closely. And so that makes it really exciting. I did a very complex thing for my first book, but hey, that's me, you know, the Porsche way. I designed it like a, like a race car. B, Beatrice, Ferdinand Porsche, and Lutz are the three main characters and their lives intertwine and they become tightly intertwined in the third part in book two that you have, but the third part, the third book. And around this project that's classified in Germany, then it all comes together. And then the reader's like, oh, shit, no wonder he went off on all these tangents. They're all coming together. Here. Exactly. Boom. Exactly. They're all in the same building together with this project. And it's like, oh, that's why he named the book Little Anton. I take a very circuitous way to do it, but I did it. The original version was 1,300 pages. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> yeah. It was difficult to do, and it took me a lot of revisions. I mean, my editor and I went back and forth for a year doing okay. that. He would send me tranches of book. And he's like, I don't know how you're going to do this, but you need to do this. I said, you're right. I got to cut this out and redo it. It took a lot. It's way too ambitious, but I did it. But it all comes together in the end. I assure the reader that. And I think I mentioned that somewhere in my forward. Yes, you do. <laughs> it, it requires a, an explanation. My new book is only 400 pages. You'll read it in a day and a half. It goes so fast. This was a little bit more sophomoric and, and retrospective in places. And it is very technical in places. It's not for you and me or your fans, but for the average reader like my wife, I mean, they don't know what 4.5 liter engine means. The average person can glaze over that. Who cares about a 12 cylinder engine versus a V8 engine? Who cares? As long as you understand what's going on. And I try to explain things in the simplest way I could, but just was a little much. It's definitely a gear heady book. 
B is an interesting character. She's just the total opposite of Portia. She's an absolute fuck up. Although they both are rebels. Yes, very and much yet, so. Young Portia was a rebel. Mercedes fired his ass. They were like, you're too wacky for us. You know, the genius. Say what you want about Hitler, but he recognized his genius. Building the Volkswagen bug, simplicity is not simple. And that's a quote from him. Damned if I know where I got it from. But I think he said it to Hitler when they laid out the, his race car, the C-Type Auto Union with 16 cylinders and two-stage supercharger. That was the opposite of the bug. I mean, that was the most advanced automobile in the world. People still marvel at it today. You can see videos of it firing up. The characters in the book, a lot of that comes from my father's military background, uh, my access to the government and the U.S. Senate through him, you know, spending time in the Pentagon. Uh, I know race team people. I know a lot of engineers. I've talked to aerospace engineers. In fact, I consulted an aerospace engineer to make sure I've got everything right on a lot of that stuff. You know, B is a pilot and everything. And so it's a complex book, but it's really about friendship and love. I mean, it's a love story. Plain Absolutely. And, and I don't want to give away where that comes in. And, and folks, it's not a Porsche's mistress. So get that out of your head. It's something no. completely different. As far as I know, he didn't have a mistress. He was very much in love with his wife, Aloysia. She was his, like my wife, she's like his right arm. Barry on the one arm and his wife on the other. And he really drew upon that strength. And there is also hidden in here a bit of a, we'll call it an homage, but it's a bit of an amalgam. There's a character that's hidden, but not so hidden. And it's a bunch of your mother's side of the family combined into one character. And if I remember correctly, his name is Redway Mellon. I thought that was really funny only because I know a little bit about your back history and, and your family tree and whatnot. So for the average reader, they may not know that, but this is the Melons, as I, I said in the intro from Pittsburgh and that whole lineage. So what was that like? And, and why did you choose to bring all that in as well? My grandfather was an OSS agent, which was the forerunner of the CIA in World War II. And he told me a lot of, about a lot of classified projects he saw with General Patton at the end of the war in Pilsen, Czechoslovakia. If somebody wants to watch my interview, it's on Dark Journalist, which is on YouTube. And he does deep state UFO things. But this is true history. Some of it's documented. But the Mellon family. We're a small family and we're in the committee of 300, 300 richest families, Rockefellers, Morgans, DuPonts, the founding families, they call them. Some people call us that. We're not a big family. There's about 130 or 40 of us alive at any given time. And I've been told by people in Washington, friends of my father and ex-CIA and you know, military Pentagon people, that there's been over 40 melons since World War II in military intelligence. I do not have their name. However, my friend and cousin, Chris Mellon, is currently involved in the UAP UFO Nimitz thing. You know, he writes articles for CNN, you know, Washington Post, New York Times. He's in there. And so he and I have had a little cross-pollinization. I wanted to put a Mellon character in there because he's not a very big character, loosely based on actually my cousin and my dad and all this. So he's a composite character. We Mellons have had a hand in all that stuff, even going back to the 30s. Uh, my great-grandfather, Andrew Mellon, had intimate dealings with Halmar Schacht, which is Hitler's private banker. And that's through Sullivan and Cromwell, which is Alan Dulles and John Foster Dulles, and it was very corrupt. And Andrew Mellon was pretty much a fascist, and <laughs> they were doing business with Hitler. Oh, he's a Republican. They were investing in Nazi Germany. So Alcoa Aluminum, the Mellons, we sold a lot of that to Germany, and they made Messerschmitts and Heinkel bombers out. You know, Standard Oil went through Portugal, Ford trucks, Chevy trucks, GM. It's a true story that when the Allied, you know, our BC 17s, the American Air Force was bombing the Ford truck factories in Germany. Germany under contract. We had to repay them to rebuild them. Out. And Chevrolet, GM and Ford. That's a true story. The Wehrmacht rolled into Russia with Chevrolet trucks on Firestone tires. The Japanese Zeros had Firestone tires. They were new old stock. Wars, business. I mean, they, no one knew who was we were going to fight, you know, in the 30s. There were tons of weapons and trucks and everything sold. I, I just find that interesting. And I mentioned that when Porsche did know Henry Ford and they were, they were friends. And Henry Ford gives Porsche, he says, your genius comes from reincarnation. And of course, Henry Ford and General Patton said that's where their genius came from reincarnational lives. The book does delve into some metaphysics and, and philosophy. There's two threads I want to pull here. And one of them is to go back to what you said about the book being 
technical and, and maybe complicated for the average person. And this is where I think I would disagree with you. And you're the author of the book. Let me put it to you from my perspective. Right? Well, you haven't gotten to the end yet. <laughs> true. That's true. That's true. Right. I mean, if Talk it goes about portion field physics. Oh man, <laughs> episode of Ancient Aliens, but we'll keep that at bay. I've always been a voracious reader. I had the distinct pleasure of meeting one of my heroes at Johns Hopkins University before he passed away, and that's Michael Crichton. And so as I've been reading your books, it reminds me of his writing style, which is also extremely technical, but brought down to a level that can be absorbed by anybody that sits behind those pages. So if you've read Sphere or Jurassic Park or Timeline or any of those, there's tons of science in there. They're not portrayed as science fiction. That wasn't his thing, but there's so much tech in there presented in such a way that it it's absorbable. And I appreciate that about this book as well. It's enjoyable for anybody that sits down and reads it. But there was also something that came out. And as I realized how long it took you to write this book, and you mentioned on your podcast several times, you were kind of laid up watching TV and you know you, you bought the laptop and all this kind of thing. And I, I wondered, as I peeled back the onion on B and Lutz and some of the other characters, I, I wanted to ask you, how much Downton Abbey were you watching while writing this book? Certainly some, but um, <laughs> I knew it. I knew it. I personally had to relearn the English language to write in the British vernacular of the 1930s. And before that, Churchill's Edwardian. But really, it was Churchill's books. I think I read most of them. I watched every English program, not just Downton Abbey, which I think is silly, but that's another story. I bring that up on purpose, but please continue your thought. I watched everything and I took notes. And I still take notes to this day. The phrases, she's around the twist. I mean, she's nuts. These little things that the British have, just like Americans have, we have vernacular slang and everything that. Colloquialisms, yeah. Make sure it was in the 1930s as much as I could. So it was doubly difficult or deuce difficult, as they would say in World War I. You know, it was mind bending. I had nothing to do in my life. I couldn't move around. I was semi hazed in pain pills some of the time, you know, when the back pain was too much. And I was laid up a lot and I would do my exercises, but really couldn't do much. I was at a place in my life where I had the time and interest to dig into. And the deeper I went into all this, the book became bigger and deeper. And as you finish it, you'll understand why. But, you know, the Germans really were into a lot of that technology. That's a whole nother side that gets into my the, the UFO side of things. Ancient Aliens is very watered down. <laughs> But it's not bad for the average person with no knowledge. But I don't agree with everything in it. The UFO field is people will rip your face off in arguments. The Germans really were into their Wunderwaffe technology. And this book gets into that. And that's a real thing, whether people want to believe that or not. They were way ahead in their atomic bomb program than we were taught. I know that. I've talked to you know generals and admirals who told me, oh, yeah, we kept that secret during the war but you didn't hear that from me. This is the kind of stuff I've had access to. And the characters in the book, they're very human. And I really dig out Porsche's human side. I have to fill in. The, every once in a while, the technical book will say, you know, he really did tie lights to his ice skates. What was that, you know, 1880 something or you know, 1890? That's a true story. He got in trouble, but that's all it said. He did this. He was mischievous. He got in trouble and his father beat him. That's the only thing the book would say. And so I had to extrapolate from there, from everything. But it was a good intellectual exercise. Now, I will say there's one part, especially when you're talking about how you absorb the language of the characters that you're writing for, especially notable characters of history. And I remember very vividly the scene where Winston Churchill, who happens to be the grand uncle of your character, Beatrice, He's in the room with uh, fellow other folks from the SIS, which is now MI6, like, you know, the precursor to MI6. He's trying to convince her, persuade her. And there's some very back and forth dialogue. And then suddenly he goes into Churchill mode. He gives this monologue. It transported me there. I mean, that's the word I want to use. Like I've heard other speeches of Churchill and I've read other books. And I was like, wow, this is really on point. And so I got to tip my hat to you on that because it, it's very well done. And there are scenes like this throughout the book that just stand out that are either extremely comical, very imaginative, super descriptive 
descriptive or just really, really on point. When you introduced Chamberlain and he's signing off her paperwork for her to go into formal training and all this stuff, it, it's just so hilarious how you just bring out this kind of nasty, snarky side of his personality. And I just, I really enjoyed it. I actually chuckled as I'm kind of reading through those pages. There's a lot of satire in the book. The humor moves it along. I mean, it's dark when it needs to be serious dark. It is. Once I, I got into Churchill's head, I can write anything in his voice. You'll really like the speech in Lion, Tiger, Bear when it comes out next month. He's addressing all the generals in Cairo. And he's like, my God. You know? And she has this back and forth with him in front of these generals, including Montgomery. You know, it's a desert war, 42. Churchill was amazing because I read all his books and somehow over the years, I just was able to write in his voice at will. And it's a lot of fun. You've mentioned before being a very skilled mimic, especially with voices and personifying yeah. people in your own way. So, I mean, I, I, we, we saw some of that at the beginning of this episode. And my wife calls them the voices. <laughs> it, the, Bloody hell. Bloody fucking hell. They're not nearly as scary as the ones that are inside your head. That, that's right. all. Yeah. <laughs> the conversation between Briggs, her father, and Churchill and her, and I think Lord Cherwell was in there, and he was yes. a scientist. The kinds of things they're discussing were actually true, but I pulled a million different things and I created this scene. Briggs is kind of this gruff old soldier, tough on B a lot, but he loves her and he dotes upon her, but he's very fearful of her going to spy on the Germans because he knows what she's up against. And they're talking about the German engineering. Where does it come from? And he's like, I know. I didn't remember it, but now I know. And he goes off into this monologue about the German airships of the 19th century and their engineering schools and the occult and other things. And it's all based on truth. You know, they did have philosopher scientists in, in Prussia and the early German states. And he knew it all because he's a military historian. He teaches at Sandhurst. I was able to do that because he had the knowledge of that. He was amazed that he could help his daughter with this weird operation that they want to do. You know, they think it's a walk in the park. Park, of course, it is nothing of the sort. She grows up a lot. She's very headstrong and immature and racist and classist, and she's snob, and she's very intelligent, and she's a good pilot, and she's a good driver, and so she understands engineering. She has her dainty side with her friends, and they're hard drinking, and they cuss, and, you know, and that's based on women that I know. Some of it's based on my own sisters and their friends. You know, I know some people in British high society I was able to draw upon. It's just my background. And I don't mean to offend by making this, you know, Downton Abbey reference, but for me as a reader, I've always somehow tried to imagine what the person would look like. Sometimes an author does a good job of describing, oh, she had long flowing blonde hair and metallic blue eyes and whatever. And you're like, okay, well, fine. But in my head, you know, everybody either looks like a cartoon character or a Muppet or somebody from Star Trek. So, you know, it's one of those kind of deals. Kidding aside, the scene that did it for me was actually when Beatrice was bantering back and forth, really battling back and forth between her German tutor is uh, Frau Gerwig, I think is her name. <laughs> yeah. It suddenly hit me. That's Lady Mary Crowley from Downton Abbey. Whether you painted that picture or not, I saw that just rigid, like she buckled down, dug in her heels and she fought back. It didn't matter what her teacher was going to say. It was pound for pound. She was just going after it. And it's like in that stubbornness, I also pulled through the thread that I didn't realize until later, which was the feminism part of it. There's a side to this book that I want my daughters to read when they're old enough to read it and understand. It's very true. All the, all the women setting records in the 30s, they really did a great job. And of course, World War II, they became pilots and ferry pilots and nurses. And, and so it does have that. And the second book continues in that thread, Be an Alice. I actually was terrible at languages. And in high school, I would go back and forth. My French teacher was this little fiery French guy. We both had this crazy sense of humor. And I would say, call him a, a withering snail in French. And I would draw <laughs> things on the black. It was all based on my high school experience. That's so, so funny. Downton Abbey is a good visual, but Downton Abbey is very sanitary. And it is. It's a very good show about the British upper class. It is. But they cussed a lot more and they had a lot more dirty, drug taking, boozing episodes than Downton Abbey. It's very sanitized. I always enjoy the downstairs scenes. When B does go downstairs and, and visits with staff. And of course, when I was growing up, I hung out with the housekeepers all the time. I, I really enjoyed the blue collar people. I still do mechanics. You know, everybody. And those are the most interesting people because the rich people always put on airs and armor 
and they never say what they mean and it's absolutely frustrating and so b is like fuck this you know that's part of me and b it's like fuck this i'm gonna get to know the real interesting people like that pilot amy johnson who is not a rich fancy person and so they became good friends and amy is a real person she's a hero most people don't know who she is, even in England. I had to look her up myself because she's in the forward. You have a picture over there. At first, you know, as I'm reading the book, I'm like, is B Amy Johnson? Is that the parallel here? Is that what we've done? And then I realized, no, 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 no. Because like, you specifically call out that they're friends. And so I'm like, oh, now there's this, I have this whole image of another person, right? It cleared it up for me as we went along. That also led me to dig into some of the episodes of your podcast where you, I don't remember the lady that you interviewed who was responsible for interviewing all of the wasps they call themselves and the wasps which were yeah. the women air fairy squadron or whatever correct my acronym it was an amazing story and, and i'm very passionate about world war ii history myself but that's a side of world war ii history actually i didn't even know about and i was like wow this is amazing you know women get downplayed in movies and the press and, and, and history it's changing you know of course but you know my experience with the women racing drivers and having grown up in a house full of women, Liz Taylor and everybody. And, you know, she was a wild child for sure. So there's some Liz Taylor and B as well. It's a shame. This world is very conservative and patriarchal and quasi-fascist. And, you know, it, is, it just is. And the United States is. And women were given second-class status and still do carry that. Glass ceilings are real. It's better now, but it is so hard. A, a CEO told me one time, I said, what, what is it like climbing to the top and being CEO? And she's like, well, that glass ceiling was tough, but I basically had to put a suit on and become a man to do it, to be one of the boys. And that may be very sad, but it's just the truth of our reality. And of course, B gets into the ancient Druid women, the divine feminine, in, in that chapter 109. And she learns that the reason that the Vatican and everyone went after Druids and witches, which is another word for woman druid. And these were not evil people doing black magic. They were doing white magic, being very conscious and everything like that. And that's why they were going after. She learns this in chapter 109. She learns the whole shebang in McMaster's view. It's, it's the gift of the lamp, which is based on the Hermetica and other things. It's kind of funny how your mind runs away sometimes. So I know oh, I, I, and not again, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make another Downton Abbey reference here because as I painted this picture of Michelle Dockery playing B in my head, that was like my visual cue there. I'm like, okay, you know, the, the, the bobbed off black hair and that scowl and everything. Then there's Lutz. And I love the story you tell and when you introduce his character and he's the humble mechanic, you know, or he's rather the fabricator and he's driving this big old ox cart of a Mercedes truck down a hillside and he sees Ferdinand Porsche broken down and there's this whole back and forth with him. It's funny this like almost runaway truck scene where he's hauling ass down these switchbacks and Porsche's like doing the mommy arm and you know this is the way I'm painting the picture but he's like he's okay with it because he's also almost like a talent scout he's like in the back of his head he's going this kid can drive where the hell did he come from why don't we know about him and obviously that sets him in a totally different trajectory it changes his life entirely he was Hitler Jugend right he was Hitler youth he was NSKK motorcycle basically police officer patrol this character's so multifaceted but then I drew this sudden parallel I went oh my god it's Tom Branson the mechanic he was IRA he was patriotic Ireland all this kind of thing and I'm like sort of similar but not distant cousin right and then i started to realize the interaction that my made up lady mary character was having with him in their first interaction is how she interacted with matthew crawley the first time and then it became more like henry talbot and i'm like here i am fantasizing and i'm like no stop stop the train has left the station right so those are some of the things that maybe to draw people in hoping you guys see the fantasy see the type of thing that john the picture he's painted here but set in world war ii germany instead Porsche was a talent scout he saw baron rosemeyer and said this guy has got the balls i think as you and, and all your fans know gearheads and racers and car nuts we're birds of a feather and so very true. strangers and you know and the truck was actually fairly new it was it belonged to the NSKK. It was a Mercedes diesel and Porsche did design the Mercedes diesel. He's like, hey, I designed this thing, <laughs> you know, for Mercedes. He's like, oh, I know, Professor. You know, he was very enamored with him. He's hauling ass to, to impress him. Porsche's getting nervous because he's like, I'm with some idiot who can't drive. And he's hauling ass. And then the gearhead thing switches on like a differential. Boom. And Porsche's like, go faster. Lutz is like, oh my God. 
and so if any racing driver, as you know, we can get into anything, a van, a truck or anything, and drive it at 10 tenths of the limit. You can get into anything because you know instantly, you know, how everything handles. And okay, now in two seconds, you can take any rental car and take it to its limits because you know where the limits are. And Luch is naturally like that because he does all these runs. And I grew up on dirt bikes. That dynamic movement becomes instinct, second nature. And so that's what Lutz and Baron Rosemeyer share. And that's what makes them good driver. Hell, Baron Rosemeyer didn't even, never drone a car before. So he had none of the bad habits. Lutz was the same way. I wrote, that's why they became best friends. And all those pranks and everything, that, that's all based on true stories. And that scene too with Porsche and Lutz going down the hill. And, and like you, to your point, you're in a truck and you're hauling ass. And I kind of had this thing in my head, like I kept thinking Porsche's going, I designed this thing, but I never designed it to operate like this. And it yeah. suddenly kind of melted his brain. He's like, to your point, if we can do this with a truck, what can we do with the race car? But then I also had this flash forward, like Sabine Schmidt in a Ford Transit at the Nurburgring type of moment where it was like, that's who Lutz is internally. Like he's Sabine Schmidt. Like he's that type of driver, you know, where he's just naturally gifted and naturally talented. And, or as we say, he's full send. His risk mitigation button, it doesn't exist, you know? And I thought that was just awesome. And it was a great way to introduce that character. And then as they all begin to interact later in the book together, it's just, it's a good story. Story, and I don't want to spoil it. So I'm hoping more and more people will, you know, pick up a copy of Little Anton and begin to read it. You know, you've mentioned a couple times, let's call it book number four, the sequel to the sequels, <laughs> the sequel to the brick and the stick. What is Lion, Tiger, Bear about? If you want to give us a little bit of foreshadowing. Lutz is in it, but in a very strange way. But I'm not going to ruin that for you. It does play a small part in the book. But B and Alice are back. And it's the Desert War in 1942. B gets shot down near Siwa Oasis. And the Germans, the Italians, the Africa Corps had occupied it. So she does a whole adventure there. And then she and Bernie and Alice and this new character, Guafa, who is a black African Molly, very capable man, used to steal airplanes and trucks. So he's kind of a gearhead with B. There's a scene with them. B's got an engine on fire and an Italian fighter. She's in a C-47 cargo plane, troops firing out the windows. You know, it's based on a, a true story. They would smash the windows open and start firing at the plane. If you yaw the plane back and forth, I'm a pilot. She's doing all this funky aerobatics. And so this guy comes up and helps her fly the damn thing. You got one engine on fire, another one. And they were able to restart one of the engines. It's a radial engine, Pratt & Whitney. Even with three or four cylinders gone, it'll still run. B and her team, they go to Cairo. The book is much more into the occult, Atlantis lore, and German anti-gravity experiments. And they go on this adventure operation in the Zagros Mountains of Iraq. So it, it takes place mostly in the desert regions. The Germans were in Iraq in 1941. Not a lot, but there was a Luftwaffe unit. And Porsche comes back as a character. I'm not talking about it. <laughs> I can't wait to read it. He's so you, in there. Don't worry about it. He's in there. So his journey is not complete. When you get towards the end and B has been captured by the Germans, she goes through some horrible torture and other things, and she comes out with PTSD. And I've learned all about it from talking with these young veterans and the older guys, too. Vietnam. So it comes from firsthand accounts for battle fatigue. She goes through combat and it does change her as it did to many young people who grew up in a hurry in World War II. My dad was 17 when he got in the Navy. These young people, they grew up really fast. And so a lot of those things, I, I talk to veterans about it. And actually, I've gotten good comments from veterans about the book. It's almost poetic justice in a way, because in the first volume, when she is going through her SIS training and they take her up into the highlands of Scotland and her trainer is hilarious. I had this whole army of darkness moment where I thought she was going to turn to him and say that whole scene where the, I'm the king of Scotland and the king of this and that. And yeah, you're the king of Jack and shit. And Jack just left town. I expected her to like come off totally like that, but they broke her down. That was his mission yeah. and to rebuild her. But she said at one point, I'm never going to need this much like some students say about the things that they learn in school, I'm never going to need this kind of math. I'm never going to need this kind of grammar or English. And I think bringing the story to that point is 
poetic justice. She learns her lesson, maybe not necessarily in the most delightful way. It brings it all together. And I very much appreciate that. It's based on true accounts. My grandfather, Paul Mellon, was in the OSS. He was an army major in World War II. And one of his jobs was training French women to, in England to jump out of a C-47, Woody Bird, behind the lines. And they were trained by the SOE, the Special Operations Executive. And that training, which that happened later in the war, but that training was extensive hand-to-hand -hand combat. This is 1937. There's no SOE. The SIS is very small. They don't have any funds. So what is her boss, McMaster, going to do? Well, he sends them to the best soldiers he know of, and that's the Seaforth Highlanders in Scotland. And they're like, what the hell are we doing with this woman? And, you know, it was for king and country. And so they did it, but they did it the only way they knew how. And they don't like the fact that she's a spy. They call her a goddamn sneak thief and worse. And that's how they would do it. And of course, she realizes she was so angry at McMaster for that training. And then he says, do you know what those guys had to go through? She's like, yes, no. they were humiliated. They, they were humiliated in front of their fellow soldiers and cat called and yelled at in the mess hall. And so she sends them a case of whiskey. She grows up. You know, these are the, some of the things that I went through in my life and everyone goes through some things. All of a sudden you grow the hell up. And then she needed a lot of growing up. I like those chapters. I fought with my editor. He said I should condense it into one. Eh, maybe wow. I should have, but because later in the series, you know, there's going to be several more books. Where does B get her training and instincts from? Well, you know, Seaforth Highlanders and also the Nazis train her. So she has double training. Mm. And a lot of women made very good soldiers. It, it's a myth. They went behind the lines for SOE and, and the French resistance, and they were incredibly brave and capable. I had a woman write me out. Why are you so violent with all this? I said, this is based on truth. Dr. Ferdinand Porsche Sr., he passed away in 1951, if I remember my Porsche history correctly. So this means that the torch will be passed at some point in your series of books, specifically to be because she's going to outlive him. Obviously, she outlives Amy Johnson. She outlives a lot of other people in the story. So is the future of the series, if we were to imagine and theorize, is it all about B? What, what does the future beyond Lion, Tiger and Bear look like, kind of as you're just ruminating on these ideas? B is still the main character, but she has this team of people, uh, the four of them, Bernie, Alice, Guafa, uh, the African guy from Mali. And they are, in World War II, I dig out a lot of little known history. That's my thing. MI6 did indeed have an occult division. And occult is just a word meaning hidden knowledge. It doesn't mean black magic and cats. And witches, Mysticism, you know, yeah. Ancient wisdom and philosophy. and But they've got to go do a job against the German SS on an airbay. And everyone will recognize in the first Indiana Jones movie, they show the Germans digging for the lost ark. Well, that's based on truth. That's the Anon Air Bay SS, although Spielberg watered it down. He didn't call it that, but that's who they were. They didn't have the SS uniforms. He didn't want to go there, but that's the Anon Air Bay SS. And they deal with those guys intimately in this book. A lot of fun, this new story. And Porsche is a great character because he, now he's confronted with unimaginable engineering and also, you know, these metaphysical and wild adventures. And it's funny, he's going back with this real life physicist named Walter Gerlach. And they're loggerheads over everything. He's like, you're just a simple mechanic. I'm a quantum physicist. He's like, screw you. And, you know, it was a lot of fun. So when does Lion, Tiger, Bear come out? In about a month. It should be on Amazon in about a month. The faster read is, my wife read it in a day and a half. Where can folks find the books if they're interested in picking them up? Amazon, or you can go to my website, littleanton.com. I have all that information and links. And there's sample chapters to read from the new book too. And there's something special about the purchase of the book, which actually is very near and dear to us here at GTM. And what's that, John? Well, I donate all my profits to Wounded Warrior Charities. My wife and I have the honor of working with wounded veterans twice a year at our farm. They come for a black powder deer hunt and a picnic and everything. We're going into our sixth year now. It's our way of giving back to these young men and women. And I give out copies of my book. It's just a very rewarding thing. There's very few farms in Virginia that people are afraid. Just me and this one other guy in Rappahannock County that we do this. I think it's a shame. And I have a small foundation that I give away everything. All my work, research, everything I do, you know, I do it for free, obviously. Uh, and we thank you for it. And again, we try to do a lot of different philanthropic projects here at GTM. And we've worked with folks like Peter Klein at Vet Motorsports, who worked at Helmets Off to Heroes, Wounded Warriors, et cetera. 
the DOD is very near and dear to our hearts because jokingly, a lot of folks refer to us as the car club of the DOD sometimes. And so for us, it's really important that we're doing these kinds of things for the veterans that are in our group, for our, our enlisted, there's car enthusiasts and whatnot. So this is really cool. It's, it's an interesting intersection between military history, car history, and everything that is in this series. And I urge people to pick up the books and check them out. John, had it not been for our initial chance encounter during 2018, 2019 classic car season, and you kind of handing me a book going, hey, check this out. I wrote this. And I'm like, okay. And the conversations that we had, I wouldn't have really taken the deep dive into this universe that you've created, this, this let's call it alternate or revisionist history of this part of World War II centered around characters like Dr. Portia, like B, like Lutz, et cetera. It has been an epic ride, to use your word. It's a very enjoyable read. I highly recommend it for a lot of people. And so what I want to tell the audience is to learn more about our guest tonight, John W. Warner IV, you can find him on Google. Reads. You can also visit littleanton.com for more information and get behind the scenes information on the series, on the book. John's been on History Channel. He's got YouTube videos. There's podcasts, which is also known as Beyond Little Anton. And there's not a ton of episodes. I listen to them all. They're really, really great. And it's fun to listen to John kind of go deep in with his guests. Hopefully, there'll be more of those episodes later on. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. And you can also find John on all the social media majors at Little Anton Book. That being said, John, it's been an absolute pleasure. It's been an education. And I can't thank you enough for coming on and doing this crossover episode from Beyond Little Anton with us here at Grand Touring Motorsports on Break Fix. Oh, it was a lot of fun. My pleasure. That's right, listeners. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to check out our Patreon for a follow on Pit Stop mini sode. So check that out on www.patreon.com forward slash GT Motorsports and get access to all sorts of behind the scenes content from this episode and more. If you like what you've heard and want to learn more about GTM, be sure to check us out on www.gtmotorsports.org. You can also find us on Instagram at Grand Touring Motorsports. Also, if you want to get involved or have suggestions for future shows, you can call or text us at 202-630-1770 or send us an email at crewchief at gtmotorsports.org. We'd love to hear from you. Hey, everybody. Crew Chief Eric here. We really hope you enjoyed this episode of Break Fix, and we wanted to remind you that GTM remains a no annual fees organization. And our goal is to continue to bring you quality episodes like this one at no charge. As a loyal listener, please consider subscribing to our Patreon for bonus and behind the scenes content, extra goodies, and GTM swag. For as little as $2.50 a month, you can keep our developers, writers, editors, casters, and other volunteers fed on their strict diet of Fig Newtons, Gummy Bears, and Monster. Consider signing up for Patreon today at www.patreon.com forward slash GT Motorsports. And remember, without fans, supporters, and members like you, none of this would be possible.